Hello and welcome to the webinar, Disease Modifying Therapies for Multiple Sclerosis. My name is Jane Gilliland and I'll be your presenter today. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that I have recorded on today and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. I also acknowledge my gratitude that we share this land today, my sorrow for the costs of that sharing, and my hope and belief that together we can shift to a place of equity, justice, and partnership. A little bit about me. So my name is Jane Gilliland. I'm a registered nurse, and I'm also internationally certified as an MS certified nurse. I work here at MS Plus as an MS nurse advisor, and at MS Plus we cover Tasmania, Victoria, New South Wales and the ACT. And my role is uh, speaking to people like yourself over the phone and via email, providing information, support, advice and education. Talking about disease modifying therapies is a lot of what I do. So if you would like some extra support or information, you can call to book an appointment with me or one of my lovely nursing colleagues via Plus Connect on 1800 042 138 or emailing connect at msplus.org.au. So today we're going to be looking at treatments, how we categorise the different drugs that are available, an overview of each of the drugs that we have, what you might be able to expect when you're going on one of these treatments, what the side effects are, and I've also compiled some of my helpful tips that I have learnt over my years and gathered from other nurses, doctors and people living with MS. A little uh, glimpse into when to change medications as well, because if you don't already know, it is not uncommon for people to change therapies over the years and some decision making ideas. How do I choose? It's a big, uh, a big decision about choosing if you're going to go on therapy and also which one. So we'll be having a little look at that as well. So how is MS treated? Well, there's kind of three main branches that we're going to um, look at in terms of how MS is treated. Disease modifying therapy is what we're going to cover today. And the two other branches would be symptom management and a brain healthy lifestyle. So disease modifying therapy is like your sunscreen. It's going to slow the disease progression over time. And by doing that, it does minimise the symptoms that develop. It doesn't necessarily make you feel better day to day when you're on disease modifying therapy, but the huge benefit it does provide is it stops the MS from progressing as much as it would have if you didn't have that treatment on board. Symptom management is like your aloe vera, so it is going to make you feel better day to day. Symptom management is taking pain medication for nerve pain, it is having a fatigue management plan for fatigue, um, it could be having strategies to manage cognitive changes or um, even changing your diet to manage continence changes. So they're the things that are going to help you feel better day to day and minimise the impact of the damage that's already happened. The third thing is a brain healthy lifestyle because brain health is really important because MS is a condition that is affecting the brain and the spinal cord. And so I've put those down as like the umbrella and the sun hat and the sunglasses, they complement the other things. And a brain healthy lifestyle does help to slow the disease progression and minimise the symptoms as well. But today we'll just be covering those disease modifying therapies. So what about the impact of the disease modifying therapies? Why do we take them? Well, we know from the Brain Health Time Matters in Multiple Sclerosis uh, project that you can see in the green here, intervention at diagnosis, which means taking disease modifying therapies quite timely after you've been diagnosed with MS, has the best outcome than say delaying treatment to be a little later on, which is in the grey, or someone who doesn't have any treatment at all. So in terms of the potential outcome, in terms of disability that can accrue over time, we know that disease modifying therapies are proven time and again to slow down the progression of MS and reduce the number of lesions that develop, relapses that happen, symptoms that accumulate over time. So that's why it is recommended for people with MS to consider disease modifying therapies. So what do we have available? Well, gosh, it is really changing over time and we have quite a lot happening. I put this together as best as I could to show that 
we've really come a long way and there's been lots of change. So it's really good that you're watching this to get up to date um, with what's happening because I re-record these every six months or so because of what's changing. You can see back in the early 1990s, we had some injectable drugs and they were the first ones that came about. Um, the betaferon and Avonex and Rebif are all types of what we call an interferon, an injectable medication. And then we also had Capaxone, a, a daily medication. And so these were the first drugs that were around and were very well used. We then got Tysabri, which you can see in that peachy colour there, that's an infusion and then moved into some oral medications in the yellow, the Jelenia, the Tecfidera and the Obagio. We then got um, the Lemtrida, which is an infusion, Plegridi, which is a fortnightly interferon, so that was quite a game changer, as well as Capaxone came about in 2016 in a three times a week version. So previously it was a daily injection and then they changed it so that you could have it three times a week. In about 2019, we got Ocrevus, which is an infusion-based drug, and then Mavenclad came about, and the green uh, little boxes here I've put to show kind of news or other things. So Jelenia and Tysabri were approved for paediatric use because unfortunately, uh, people under the age of 18 are diagnosed with MS and, and should be able to access medication as well. Zimbrita was a injectable drug that was on the market for a short time before it was withdrawn. And we've also seen Orbagio delisted. So the brand name is no longer available, Orbagio. It's now only available in the generic form. Recently, we've had Rebif removed from the PBS. So it's uh, no longer available under the pharmaceutical benefits scheme and, and no longer being uh, manufactured. And the same with Avonex. Avonex will be removed the 1st of April this year. It will no longer be available. And you can see uh, from this image here that there's so many other options that are available and potentially more effective and may have a different side effect profile as well. There's also a PBAC submission happening for a Tysabri to be available by injection. PBAC is the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee, and that's a group of people uh, mixed in their specialty, whether it's being a health economist, a pharmacist, a, a general everyday person, a doctor, and they are a group that review the submissions. So when a drug company wants a drug to be on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme, they want the government to subsidise a drug so that the Australian public can have access to it. It's the PBAC that reviews the submission to say, yes, put that on the PBS, people should have access to this, or no, they shouldn't. And uh, I think I also forgot to mention Vimerity as well. So we've had Vimerity and Zaposia and Casimpta as well. So there is lots happening and there's no reason to expect that there won't be other changes in the future. So categorising these drugs is a really good way for you to get your head around the difference between them all, because gosh, there are so many. So if we look at the form of the drugs, how do they come? So in injectable, we have Avonex, Plegridi, Casimpta, Betaferon and Capaxone. And I've already touched on the fact that Avonex will no longer be available. The uh, drug company won't make it anymore. So people on Avonex will have to either uh, review and maybe change to another interferon or use this as a great a great uh, prompt to have a disease modifying therapy review. In regards to the oral medication, we have Mazent, Zaposia, Jelenia, Teraflunamide, which is the generic name for Abagio. We have Mavenclad, Tecfidera and Vumeridi. And then in terms of infusions, we have Ocrevus, Tysabri and Lentrada. What about the effectiveness? Because they are a little bit different in how well they work. So the Association of British Neurologists have a categorization system that they use. So I've adopted that just to give you a bit of an idea of how they might differ. Um, there may be some individual opinions that vary from this. So just keep that in mind as well. When we're looking at the least effective medications, it's those interferons. So the Avonex, uh, Plegridi, Betaferon, and also Capaxone, and then Teraflunamide, which is that oral medication. The low category probably prevents maybe 30% of lesions and relapses, for example. That's the number they use, whereas moderate is looking at about 50% um, efficacy. And then the highly efficacious drugs, it's about 70% or more. 
So in that moderate category, we have oral medications. So that's Mazent, Zaposia, Jelenia, Mavenclad, Tecfidera and Vimirini. And the highly efficacious drugs are Oprivus, Tysabri, Lemtrada and Kisinta. And I haven't listed them in any specific order, so don't read too much into which order I put them in. What about the types of MS that they treat as well? Because that differs. So mostly you can see that relapsing remitting MS has lots of options, that's where most of the drugs work. For secondary progressive MS, there is one drug, Mazent, and then for primary progressive MS, there is Ocrevus. You can see Ocrevus listed twice because it is proven to have benefit, uh, benefit in relapsing remitting MS as well as primary progressive MS. However, it's only been PBS listed for relapsing remitting MS. That's not for lack of trying, there has been submissions, but at the moment it's not available on the PBS for people with primary progressive MS. So if you're going to go on one of these treatments or you're being worked up to have one of these treatments, you will commonly uh, expect that you'll have tests and things to prepare you. They can differ depending on your doctor, what pre-existing conditions you have, um, and also what drug you're choosing, but Examples of what might happen before you're started on medications, definitely a neurologist appointment, MRIs, a blood test. Uh, they can check lots of different things in those blood tests depending on what they're interested in, but quite often looking at things like your white cell counts. There's something called an anti-John Cunningham virus antibody test, and that's quite specific to MS. You may have heard of the JCV test and that's the one they send over to Denmark. I'll cover that in the next slide. We're going to talk about that. And they'll also be checking about whether you've got any kind of dormant things going on or history of other conditions you may have. So looking at things like tuberculosis or shingles, hepatitis, HIV. It's not because anyone necessarily is saying we think you have these. They're making sure that you don't have them or checking that you've had exposure to these things in the past. Um, so that they know kind of what vaccines you might need to catch up on. So it's just about kind of establishing the lay of the land in your body. With some vaccines, you may need to catch up on some before starting treatment. And that's because a lot of these drugs are immunosuppressive. And so vaccines like live vaccines are not recommended on treatment. And even some non-live vaccines may not work as well. So with vaccines, uh, that is the one thing to really remember, that if you're going on an MS medication, um, you're really advised not to have any vaccines without checking with your team. It's not to say it's not safe to have vaccines on disease modifying therapy. Things like the COVID vaccine and the yearly flu vaccine are non-live vaccines. So, and, and not at all um, thought to pose any harm to you, but it's always good to check, especially about the timing and which vaccines you'll have. Once you start treatment and after you might finish treatment, there continues to be screenings that are recommended or things that we need to check on. So you would still be having neurologist reviews, MRIs and blood tests, and uh, you might be advised to keep up to date with the general health screenings that are out there for the Australian community. Depending on your age and your sex, there might be things like pap smear, yearly skin checks, mammograms, prostate checks, bowel cancer screenings, it's not because any of these drugs are necessarily going to cause these problems to happen, but in theory, your immune system is your defence system in your body. That's your security team. And so if we're changing the way that system works, you may be potentially slightly more likely to have any of these things pop up. It's more of a background theory, I would say. And you'll be advised if there's anything extra special that you need to do, but it's more about being... Uh, vigilant with these things because for many people we let these things kind of slip by the wayside so just keep up to date with what you're supposed to be having and you can always check with your GP to say hey is there anything I'm lagging on is my pap smear overdue or maybe you haven't ever had a full body skin check it's not just about saying you know can you check this little spot on the back of my hand it's about going to have a full body skin check where they look at everything to make sure that there's nothing going on. So let's just have a quick look at this JCV PML situation because it's quite unique. Um, it does occur in some other conditions, but you probably haven't heard of it before. So the JCV is the John Cunningham virus, and then PML is progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. That's really difficult to say, so we call it PML for short. 
With uh, JCV, it's a common virus and it's completely unrelated to MS. Up to 85% of adults have JCV and you don't know if you've caught it because it doesn't make you sick when you catch it. Um, you don't know if you'd give it to someone else. It's mostly kept under control by the immune system and that's fine. But if the immune system is weakened in a particular way, JCV can reactivate and progress into PML. PML is a rare brain infection that gets worse over time. And so because this is potentially something linked to a couple of the MS treatments, this is why we keep an eye on it. So there are what we call risk mitigation strategies. Risk mitigation means what are you doing to prevent something from happening when maybe it's not exactly preventable. So think about uh, driving with a seatbelt on. A seatbelt is a risk mitigation strategy for you being harmed in a car accident. So your neurologist is going to uh, look at a variety of factors, including this anti-JCV antibody blood test, because uh, patients who test positive for antibodies to JCV are at a higher risk of developing PML than those who test negative. If you test positive for antibodies to JCV, it indicates that you've been exposed to the virus, but it does not mean you'll get PML, and PML is not linked with all of the drugs, but you'll see as I go through each of the drugs that it will pop up a few times. So good for you to have a bit of an understanding about this. Um, and if you test positive for JCV, it doesn't mean you can't go on these uh, particular drugs either. It's just all about figuring out what's right for you. And do have a chat with your doctor if you want more information about how this might work in your case. Let's start with our deep dive. So interferons. I've put the Avonex, Vetoferon and Plegridi all together because they're all types of interferons. Interferons are proteins that naturally occur in the immune system and we don't exactly know how it works but we think it reduces inflammation and also reduces that immune response that is involved in attacking the body's own myelin. Because what's happening with MS is that for some reason your immune system has learnt that it can cross the blood-brain barrier, go into the brain, the spinal cord, the optic nerve and see that myelin which is that insulation coating a nerve and attack that myelin. And so we need to get in the way of that happening somehow to prevent it from happening again. So the differences between these drugs would be whether they're injected into the muscle. So you may have had uh, intramuscular injections, they're commonly given on the upper arm and they, they, they kind of hurt a bit more than a subcutaneous, which means um, uh, quite beneath the skin into the fat, into what we call that adipose tissue. So um, if you can pinch somewhere and get a little bit of fat between your fingers, maybe on your arm or under your belly button in that little pot belly area, that's where we give subcutaneous injections. Now, depending on the drug, they may come in a pre-filled syringe or you might mix it yourself. And then it may be dosed either, say, weekly or every second day or fortnightly. And these drugs are all in that low efficacy category. If you're going on one of these uh, drugs, you'll need to know how to do it because these are drugs that people give themselves or sometimes we'll have the support of a spouse or a family member or a carer, but mostly you would be doing it yourself. You need to know where to give these injections and the right way, as we said, because we don't want it to go too deep if it's not supposed to be an intramuscular and we want to make sure it's not getting injected into the joints or the nerves or the bones. So there are very uh, well guided injection site maps to say you can inject here or you can inject here or here to tell you how to do that. And some of these drugs also do need to be kept refrigerated. And then we need to think about thoughtful disposal, so using things like sharps containers. Because it's an injectable, you're going to have some kind of mark or bump or bruise around the injection site as well. So it's good to expect that that could happen. Let's have a look at the side effects. I've done my best to represent all the side effects that are listed for all of these drugs, but there may be um, some changes or some differences depending on where you're looking. But with the interferons, we do see flu-like symptoms, especially in that 24 to 48 hours after you've had that injection. And then it could be things like headache or injection site reactions, um, could be some depression or muscular or joint pain. Less commonly, could be some hair thinning or changes to the periods and very rarely kidney problems or difficulty breathing. So what are some helpful tips? Well, if you're someone that's developing flu-like symptoms, you might actually like to preempt that and think about what time of day will I have my injection? Will I have my injection in the morning and then be unwell for the day? 
or perhaps have it at night so I can sleep through the worst part of it and which part of the week is better? Is it better on a Monday? Is it better on a Friday? What works better for you? And then also because of those flu-like symptoms, there can be some kind of general pain, a bit of a fever, headache. So if it's safe, you might like to consider taking something like uh, paracetamol or ibuprofen that can be taken beforehand and then at four to six hourly intervals afterwards um, just to get a handle of those symptoms so that you know the side effects so that you don't feel too unwell. Capaxone, uh, the generic name is Glutyrima acetate. It's for relapsing, remitting, and it's three times per week. Majority, if not everybody, usually has this on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, and that just makes it a really easy way of uh, remembering when to have it. It is one of the, the least effective drugs and it works as a chemical decoy. So uh, capaxone is made up of a synthetic version of uh, amino acids that look very similar to myelin. So we think it's like a bit of a decoy and says, hey, attack me over here instead of attacking the myelin. What to expect? Um, there's not too many tests or screenings that are required. It does require refrigeration, sharps containers, and you want to get into a bit of a routine so that you know where to take it and you're not forgetting it. And because it's an injection, you're going to have some bumps or lumps or bruising potentially. And um, because you'll be doing this over time, these injections, it's not a once-off thing. You'll be doing this week in, week out for months, if not years, then um, there is a potential for some scarring around those injection site areas. In terms of side effects, injection site reactions, and then lipoatrophy, which is indentations in the skin. It kind of looks a little bit like bad cellulite, if you can imagine that. And that's just because the, the area of tissue is continually being used for injections. Uh, less commonly, there can be some blood cell count changes and also something called an immediate post-injection reaction. This doesn't happen to everybody and it may only happen to you once or, or never, but it's really good to know it can happen because gosh, it can give you a fright if you don't know what it is. It can occur shortly after the injection, um, as the name would suggest, and it can cause a, quite a frightening set of symptoms. It could be flushing, so your face could get quite red and, and, and warm. You could have some chest tightness. You may feel short of breath or palpitations, which is when you can feel that your heart is beating. This reaction could last a minute, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and if it does happen, it's thought to be um, not at all harmful and will go away by itself and doesn't cause any long-term issues. But if it lasts longer than 30 minutes or if it gives you a real fright and you're not sure, by all means, get the help that you need. But um, in theory, if it does happen, it's going to be really harmless other than just giving you a bit of a fright and it will go away. So make sure that you're aware of that. Remember that can happen. If you live with anyone else, tell them that that can happen. So if it does happen, then you go, oh, right, I was told this could happen. What was I supposed to do and how do I manage it? Well, helpful tips. We talked about when we're dosing it and it can be out of the fridge at room temperature for up to one month once and that's per kind of stock and it's really good with these injections if they are cold to let them come to room temperature before injecting and that's the same with the interferons because uh, it's really more painful often to have an injection that is cold don't warm them up um, but you might just let them sit on the bench and, and gently come up to room temperature and it's now available in an auto injector so that's quite new if you're already on capaxone you might not know this that uh, previously it was in a pre-filled syringe and you would have to put that inside of another device kind of like one of those click pens a four pen um, and that's how it was given but now it comes in a single use disposable auto injector makes it a little bit easier. Teraflunamide well that was the Orbagio. So you may still hear people calling it Orbagio because that's what we knew it as for a long time, but now it's only available under generic versions. It's a daily medication and it stops immune cells from multiplying. That's the way we think it works. Pretty easy to start taking at home and you do start at the full dose. There's no special titration. In titration means you might start low and slowly uh, scope upwards. And in terms of the side effects, 
could be looking at things like increased liver enzymes, it could have some hair thinning, maybe some anxiety, some musculoskeletal pain, but it is generally quite well tolerated and there are some less common and very rare side effects as well. When we're talking about common side effects, we're talking about things like more than one in a hundred. So when you see all these slides come up, don't think that I'm like a grocery list, you're not just going to get every single thing on here, that's incredibly rare. This is what could happen and what's been noticed in the clinical trials. Helpful tips, contraception. There are a few drugs that are thought to be more harmful to a developing baby than perhaps others. Um, it's really good as a general rule to, to plan a pregnancy in MS, especially if you're on therapy, but teraflunamide is one of those drugs that there is evidence to lead us to believe that it would be harmful to a developing baby. So very important that if there's any chance you could become pregnant at all, that you use an effective method of contraception during treatment. And then if you stop taking these tablets, continue using that effective method of contraception for up to two years afterwards. Um, if we do need to get the drug out of your body in a hurry, there is something called an accelerated washout where we kind of flash it out of your body. The doctor can help you with that if it's needed. Um, but good for you to, to remember that. And think about again how you can fit this once daily dosed into your daily routine because these medications only work if you take them. So think about is there something that you do every morning, whether it's have a coffee or brush your teeth or get dressed or check your phone. Is there something that you can align the medication with so it just fits into your normal routine of getting out of bed, going to the bathroom, brushing your teeth, taking your tablets, something like that. Now we're going to have a look at uh, the fumarates and uh, there's two drugs that are quite similar and I've got them compared here so you can get an understanding of what the difference is because they are quite similar. You can see the generic name is dimethyl fumarate and diroxamol fumarate so that's why I've called them the fumarates. Tecfidera is a medication that we've had around for quite some time and you take one capsule in the morning and one at night and whereas Vumerity is something that's come around much more recently and it works in a very similar way. Uh, it's the same, uh, converts to the same thing you can see there, that monomethyl fumarate. But Vumerity is two capsules. The reason for this is it's slightly, I wouldn't say reformulated, that's probably not quite right, but um, slightly redeveloped in a way that the methanol, which is something that is thought to attribute to the side effects of Tecfidera, um, has been reduced. So in Vimeridi, there's only 10% of the methanol that is in Tecfidera, and also the molecule of the drug is actually much larger. So again, because of the differences, the changes, it's thought to be much better tolerated, which means less side effects, a bit more comfy to be on. In theory, because the molecule is so large, if they were to make it into one capsule, um, it would be really, really big. So that's why the dose is actually split across two capsules. So Vimeridi, you're taking two capsules in the morning and two at night. Tecfidera is one in the morning, one at night. So Tecfidera, uh, it's for relapsing remitting MS. It's in that moderately effective category. And again, I'm not quite sure how it works, but we think it's reducing inflammation and protecting nerve cells from damage. What to expect? Well, they're gonna do some screening tests beforehand and there is a titration. So it comes in a half dose. So usually it would be commenced at a lower dose, maybe for a couple of weeks, you might start at a, a weeny little dose and slowly get used to it. And then maybe slowly increase over those weeks so that your body can get used to the drug and um, the side effects are, are lessened. If you were to start at a full dose, you may have considerable side effects, it might be a bit more uncomfortable. And there is a, a certain kind of prescription of how that should go, but it is very common for the doctors to be able to tailor that titration. Maybe they need to extend it out a bit longer if you're not tolerating it very well. The side effects can be worse when starting. So you might um, think about how that could affect you and where you'll be, whether you're able to have some time at home or a light schedule for the first few weeks. You may feel fine, or you may be, you may be someone that wants to be close to a toilet during that time. And um, the side effects can be worse if taken on an empty stomach as well. So if you're going to take Tecfidera or you're considering it, think about how you are with your planned meal times and whether that's something that's going to work well for you. Side effects. 
very common is the reddening of the face or the body and feeling warm. We call it flushing. So it's a hot burning or itching feeling. It can be quite noticeable to other people. So it can be quite apparent or it may be something that's just a bit more present to you and it just spontaneously occurs and it might last for a couple of minutes or quite a bit longer than that. Um, not at all harmful, but it can be quite uncomfortable and some people find it quite embarrassing or confronting because it's very visible to people around you. You may have some nausea, diarrhea, what I call tum and bum upset, um, some cramping, and then also there can be some indigestion or maybe a rash as well. And then less commonly things like allergic reactions or reduction in blood platelets, and very rarely a PML, which we've covered earlier. So what are my helpful tips? Well, take it with a meal. Uh, think about something that's got a, a decent amount of fat or calories in it. This isn't an excuse to eat junk food, but when we say with a full meal, especially when we're talking about breakfast, um, we're not talking about a, a cup of coffee like I've got here um, and, a, and a biscuit. We're talking about a, a decent bowl of cereal or yogurts and fruits or eggs or veggies or whatever you're having for breakfast, but a decent sized meal because that's going to lessen the side effects and also take your tecfidera kind of halfway through. We call it a tecfidera sandwich because the idea is that you would have kind of half of your meal and then your tecfidera and then the other half of your meal and the tecfidera is nicely sandwiched in the middle. So you might think about prepping breakfast to make sure you've got something to grab and go if you're not somebody who's a breakfast person and the same with uh, dinner as well. Think about what time you'll eat your dinner because these drugs should be taken at the same time every day, so that's a good thing to consider as well. How are you going to remember? You might like to set alarms as um, dose reminders. Aspirin can help with the flushing if that happens, and do reach out to your team if you're struggling with the side effects. Let's have a look at Vimerity. Vimerity is, as we said, very similar to Tecfidera, but it's two capsules morning and night and is in that moderately effective category and works in a very similar way. There is also a titration, so the, technically it's one capsule morning and night and then in the second week two capsules morning and night. There may be some flexibility there again, so with your treating team you can have a chat with them if that needs to be extended a little bit and the side effects may vary and ease as you get used to the drug. So quite similar side effects, but potentially a little bit uh, less in how often they happen. But again, looking at that tum and bum upset, a bit of flushing, a bit of a rash, and less commonly signs of infection. They have advised that a, a meal isn't necessarily required with Vimerity. So it's not necessarily that you can't have a high fat, high calorie meal, but it may not be required as much. And um, as we said, that titration period can be extended if you're not tolerating the drug well. I believe these capsules come in a bottle and for most people, you're kind of pouring them into your grimy hands or you're putting your fingers in or if you're like me, you spill too many on your hand, they fall on the floor, you've got to pick them up again. So you might like to use something like a dose set box where once a week you can put your medications in there and they're really well organised makes it easy if you're going away or need to take the dose on the run. You don't need to take the full bottle of, of capsules with you. And also it's a good way of remembering because if you're on autopilot and you're taking these medications every day, you might get to a stage where you think, oh, actually, did I take my medication this morning? I can't remember. With a dose set box, very easy to run back and say, oh, actually the Thursday morning dose is still there, so I haven't taken it because we don't want you to overdose or underdose. So that's a good way of checking. Just like we compared the fumarates, we're going to compare the S1P receptors. Um, there's three drugs that work quite similarly, uh, if that's a word, the Jelenia, the Mazent and the Zaposia. So S1P receptors, uh, doesn't really matter too much about what they are, but for what we're talking about here, there are five S1P receptors that Jelenia kind of binds to the S1P1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. Whereas Mazent and Zaposia only um, bind to the S1P1 and the S1P5. Now, why does that matter? Because when you start Jelenia, you do need to have first dose observation monitoring because there's a chance that Jelenia could change the rate of your heartbeat. And you can see on S1P3, we talk about the AV node conduction system. That's the electrical that make your heart beat at a certain rate. Mazent and Zaposia don't actually 
binds to that S1P3 and that's the kind of difference if that makes sense. So Gelenia and Zaposia are quite similar in the way they work. Uh, Mazent is the one that's for the secondary progressive. So Gelenia, um, I think the verdict's out on whether it's Gelenia or Jalenia, so say whatever you please. Generically, it's called Fingolimod and it is a daily medication. The way that it works is it traps the lymphocytes in the lymph nodes. So you've got lymph nodes in many different places and that's where the lymphocytes mature and then are released into the blood so they can float around and do their job and Gelenia is just going to sequester them and keep them in the lymph nodes. If you're going to go into Gelenia, they'll do blood tests and particularly interested to know whether you've had the chickenpox before, whether you need to be updated on your vaccines and they may also do a eye exam because there is a side effect that's not likely to happen but it could happen called macular edema which is swelling at the back of the eye and um, it's not always symptomatic which means you could develop this condition and not have symptoms so because of that they'll do a baseline test to see how your eyes look on any given normal day and then after you've started treatment so they actually compare the differences and then during the treatment um, they'll be doing blood tests looking at your liver function and your white cell count and they um, will likely recommend yearly skin checks as well because of the side effects. You do start on a full dose and as we said there's that first dose observation uh, it goes for six hours and it's usually at a hospital or a clinic and they just measure your vital signs. It's pretty boring you shouldn't expect it to be too eventful and it's only the first dose that they need to watch you take um, because of the drug binding uh, on the first time, every other time you take this drug, the next day, the day after, the day after, there isn't a concern that the heart rate could change. It's really only that first time. The exception is if you forgot to take this drug for quite a, a, a long time, say maybe you went overseas, um, you're lucky enough you go to Fiji or something like that, you leave your tablets at home for say two weeks and when you come back, you quite um, quite likely would be recommended to have that uh, first dose observation again. So really important to remember to keep taking that drug. Side effects wise, looking at things like headache, could be back pain, could be depression. We talked about that herpes zoster virus, so it could be um, more likely to develop things like maybe shingles or even more likely to develop opportunistic infections like fungal infections or the flu. Less commonly could be that macular edema that we talked about and very rare uh, that PML as well. Helpful tips, do be sun smart. The Australian uh, recommendation for everybody, not just those with MS or Angelina, the recommendation for all of us is to wear SPF 50 every day, every single day. Doesn't matter if it's summer, winter, autumn or spring um, because there is UV all the time. And uh, with Jelenia, it's really important that you get yearly full body skin checks. So that's when you, you strip down usually to your undies or nude and they will check your whole body. They could check on looking at your fingernails, inside your mouth, between your toes. Um, really important to check on uh, that and keep up to date with your skin checks and your sunscreens as well. And if you need any recommendations on sunscreens, don't hesitate to, to let me know. I do like to dabble with sunscreen. So um, something that's affordable, that works well, that's comfortable for you should be very accessible. So let us know if you need some help with that. Don't forget to take your tablet. They only work when you take it, so you do need to. If you forget during that first of month, do give your doctor a call because that could change whether they want you to continue or have that first dose observation again. But after afterwards, if you forget for more than two weeks, you may need to have that observation period again. Zaposia works very similar to Gelenia in the way that it traps the lymphocytes. And again, um, the pre-treatment screening is pretty similar, but that first dose monitoring is not usually required unless you have a cardiac history. So you can likely start treatment at home there is a dose titration, so you'll usually have a smaller dose on days one to four, and then a little bit higher for days five, six, and seven, and then that maintenance dose, <clears throat> excuse me, which is that regular full dose, usually happens from day eight onward. So with Zaposia, uh, side effects wise, looking at things like being slightly more likely to develop some infections. So things like coughs or colds, chest infections, maybe UTI, um, and then less commonly shingles and very rare PML as well. 
So again, with the sunscreen and with the titration, it's tricky to remember when you're supposed to be changing those doses. So use your calendar, use your diary, use phone reminders, pop it on the fridge, whatever you need to do to go, okay, these days I'm taking this dose, then those days I'm taking this dose, make it very clear. Wear that sunscreen as well. And if you miss a dose, don't double dose to make up for it. Talk to your doctor as well so that they can help you figure out where you uh, need to be. Mazent, that's the last of the S1P receptors that we'll be talking about. The generic name is saponamod, and in a very unique way, it actually treats secondary progressive MS. It's a daily medication, and it works quite similarly to those other medications in trapping the lymphocytes in the lymph glands. I popped DNA here because actually as a pre-treatment screening, they'll do a blood or saliva test to check your genetic makeup, your DNA, because they'll be able to tell how fast your body will metabolize this drug and therefore what dose you should take. So it's actually personalized medicine. For a very, very small number of people, I think it's less than 1%, their body will not be able to break down this drug, so they won't be able to take it. But for majority of people, it's either like a one milligram or a two milligram dose, I believe. And then once you've started um, and you've got that titration pack, they'll be uh, checking your blood tests and blood pressure, and they may do that um, macular edema screening as well. Side effect wise, Things like headache, maybe some high blood pressure, might be more likely to get some infections or shingles. And uh, I've written directly here what was, uh, what was listed in the FETSI information about the frequency not being known about that cryptococcal infection, but it is something that is potentially possible. I've popped someone running up steps here because it is a drug that has that titration. So um, you do need to pay attention to know what you're supposed to take when so that you can work your way up to that full dose. You might like to take it in the morning as well and don't forget to be sun smart. Mavenclad. This is the first drug that we've spoken about that isn't working in a maintenance way. So all the other drugs, they work when you take them, kind of like a blood pressure tablet, for example. Or I like to think of maintenance drugs as like shaving your legs versus Mavenclad is an immune reconstitution therapy. So it's like laser hair removal, if that makes sense. Um, and that's what allows it to have an extended dosing regime. Generic name is cladribine or cladribine, and it's in that moderately effective category, although there may be some doctors that, that think it's probably a little bit higher than that as well. And uniquely, it's dosed per body weight. In years one and two, you have daily treatment for five days. So you take tablets at home uh, for five days in a row, and you do that in week one and then no treatment in weeks two, three, and four. And then in week five, you have daily treatment for five days as well. And you do all of that again in year two, and then in year three and four, you don't have to have treatment. So let's have a look at uh, what to expect with Mavenclad. So with Mavenclad, the pre-treatment screening is going to look at uh, tests for tuberculosis to make sure you've not come across it before, it's not latent in your body, um, and ruling out things like HIV or hepatitis and checking your blood cell counts as well. Once you've started treatment, or actually most importantly as a pre-treatment screening, they're going to pop you on the scales because we need to know what you weigh because that will determine how many tablets you have and also whether you take treatment for four days or five days. So you may have different amounts of tablets each day and for some people it might only be four days or five days of treatment. So that's what happens beforehand. Once you're on treatment, they will do blood tests to check um, your cell count levels, particularly your white blood cell counts. And I think that's about two months and six months. And then often they'll actually do another test before year two as well to make sure that um, not only have the cells dropped, but the uh, cell count has risen again so that it's at a safe enough level for you to take another dose of medication for them to drop again. So they are scheduled and it's very specific. So again, you must know exactly what you're supposed to take and when, and don't at all compare to what other people are doing because it's very different. 
you also shouldn't take Mavenclad at the same time as other medications. So on a day where you're having Mavenclad, very good to be very focused and allow time um, to, to follow the instructions because they'll advise you that you have to have about three hours, I think, before and afterwards without any other medications. It doesn't mean you can't eat or drink during that time, but it is a, a specific kind of thing that you need to follow. It's not too in depth, um, but in terms of uh, that day, you, might like to think that in your schedule maybe I need to allow kind of half an hour or 15 minutes at least just to sit down, refresh myself on the instructions that I got and take it. Uh, it's not kind of something you just kind of pop in your mouth when you're running out the door. You really should pay attention to what you're doing. In terms of side effects, well, you might be slightly more likely to develop the herpes virus. So things like shingles or cold sores could have a rash or some hair loss. And I should say when we're talking about hair loss with these drugs, it's not that we're expecting you to lose all of your hair very you know, um, dramatically in a number of days. It could be like transient hair thinning or a little bit of hair falling out. Uh, it shouldn't be really, really drastic. That's not at all what we're expecting. Less commonly, you could have a reduced neutrophil count as well. Neutrophils are another type of white blood cell and very rarely tuberculosis. So let's have a look at the helpful tips. So you should diarise your treatment, know exactly what days, what times, what dose, and consider that you may feel unwell during your treatment week. It doesn't mean you will feel sick, but you could feel a little bit flat, or as I like to say, you might feel a bit small. So you might just like to consider that that's not a great week to have lots of appointments or social things if you can control that, or whether you're able to work from home, or just have it in your mind that you might feel a little bit funny that week. Even if you've finished your Mavenclad in years one and two when you're in years three or four, it doesn't mean you don't have to go to the doctor. You need to be having those regular MRIs and urologist appointments. And I've put together this little graph that hopefully helps you understand that in months one and two you take tablets, no other treatment is needed for the rest of year one. The same thing is done in year two. And in year three and four, you don't need to have any treatment because you will be having your regular MRIs and urologist appointments. if by any chance there is what we call breakthrough disease activity. So if you're in year three or four, for example, and there's new lesions or relapses happening, the doctors can give you more Mavenclad if they need to or switch you to another drug if needed. Um, but in theory, the drug does cover you for four years. So that's why it's really important to continue on with that medical care. Let's have a look at Tysabri. The generic name is Nataluzumab and it works on relapsing remitting MS. It is given four to six weekly as an infusion. You go to the hospital and have it and it takes a, an hour, a couple of hours. It started off as being quite strictly four weekly um, and then since that time some people have had it extended to five or six weekly as well and uh, very rarely it might be extended a little bit more than that if someone needs to go on holiday as a once-off for example. It is a highly effective medication, works very quickly, and it works by actually being a traffic blocker. So it's not necessarily an immunosuppressant in the way that it's killing white blood cells, but it's actually binding to those lymphocytes and prevents them from crossing into that central nervous system. And if they can't get in, then they can't cause the damage. It is one of those drugs that's approved in paediatrics as well. So before you start Tysabri, they'll absolutely be doing that JCV uh, screening for you and those tests are sent to Denmark because that's the highest quality uh, testing that can be done. The drug company pays for that and they'll also be looking at your liver and kidney function and you need to have had a recent MRI as well. When you have the infusion, as I said, done in a hospital, it can be done at home. There are a couple of companies that do do that but mostly it's done in hospital and they'll be doing some vital signs kind of before you start and then during the infusion as well. And then afterwards, there's a, a, what they call a flush. So they'll flush out all the drug that's in the remaining line and uh, we'll monitor you afterwards to make sure that you're feeling okay. And that uh, monitoring period afterwards may be able to be reduced after your initial infusions if you're tolerating it really well. Most commonly, it's done in what's called infusion um, lounges or infusion centres. So it could be in a big hospital and that could be a place where people have day chemotherapy or iron infusions or treatments for Crohn's disease or other MS treatments. So it's not necessarily a specific MS place and not everyone in there is going to be having um, that drug. And usually it's quite a 
a relaxed kind of calm and, and I'm going to say clean place because often, especially during COVID, I spoke to lots of people that thought, I don't want to go to the hospital to have this treatment. I, I don't want to get sick and hospitals are really germy places. Um, the infusion centre or the infusion lounge is where other people are coming from the community in to get treatment for something that they need as well and, and quite often could be immunosuppressed just um, you know, even more so if they say, for example, on chemotherapy. So it is a place where people come in and have infusions and then go home. Once you're on Tysavri, they'll continue doing those JCV blood tests, usually six monthly, and they'll also continue with MRIs. Side effects. So commonly it could be things like urinary tract infections, um, inflammation of the nose or a headache. It could be an itchy rash or nausea and vomiting. Less commonly, you could have an allergic reaction during the infusion or discomfort. So you might feel sick or have a headache or a bit dizzy. Um, and very rarely, PML, which we covered at the start. So Tysabri is the drug that's most closely aligned with that side effect of PML, but it is, it is rare. So helpful tips, hydrate drink and drink the day beforehand because we want your circulating blood volume to be increased. We want you to be really well hydrated so that your veins are nice and plump so it's easy for the person that's going to cannulate you to put in that needle in your arm. It's easy for them to find it so making their job easier but most importantly meaning it's more comfortable for you and they don't have to try two or three times. So hydrating the day before, drinking your full two to three litres and making sure that morning that you've had something to eat and drink. It's not like a rule that you have to eat and drink beforehand, but I put that there because don't fast or wake up and feel a bit nervous and don't eat something. You want to have something in your tummy, be well hydrated, be feeling as well as possible before you have your infusion. Bring entertainment. It's going to be a bit boring after they hook you up to that infusion, they're going to say, all right, I'll be back in half an hour or so. Let me know if you need anything. And if you haven't brought anything to keep you entertained, you might get a bit anxious or start looking around the room or not have anything nice to do. So bring entertainment, bring a book, bring a phone charger within an extra long cord or pack some snacks. There's no reason medically why you can't drive yourself home from your infusion, but you just don't know how you might be feeling. So especially for the first infusion, it's really nice if you can plan to have a way to, to get home, maybe someone to pick you up and to drive you there or bring you home just in case. Because they are infusions and they're given through the arms, wear sleeves that easily roll up and especially um, you may not know if they're going to use the left arm or the right arm. So wear, wear a t-shirt or a singlet if you can and then um, because you're going to sit there for a while you might like to bring something like a hoodie or a zip-up jacket that you can kind of put backwards and keep yourself cosy while you're sitting there. And also make sure you know where you're going and where to park as well. So you might even like to do a test run beforehand um, in the days or weeks beforehand so you know exactly where to go where you can park and uh, make sure that you know in the hospital where to go so that on the day there's less of the unknown because there's nothing scarier than the unknown and it might be a yucky day so you might as well make sure you know exactly where you're supposed to be going what to do how it all works it's just going to make it a little bit smoother but when you're going in once a month for these infusions you will become very familiar with the people and the nurses and all the staff. So let's have a look at the anti-CD20 therapies. Again, I've grouped these together because they're quite similar and I'm hoping to be able to explain to you what is the difference. Ocrevus is an infusion drug and Casimta is an injection. They both target the CD20 B cells with the lymphocytes that we keep talking about. There's kind of two types. There's a B cell and a T cell. Ocrevus and Casimta work on the B cells and there are ones that we call CD20 B cells. In this image here, the yellow at the bottom is kind of like the surface of the CD20 B cell. And there's kind of two loops, I suppose. Um, Ocrevus is thought to bind to one loop on the top of the B cell, whereas Casimta is binding to two loops. So the idea is that Casimta has a bit of a stronger hold I suppose onto that cell or it's, it's holding on in more than one place and so I suppose the idea is because there's higher affinity they can get the same level of effect with a lower dose which is why it can be given as an injectable versus ocrevus as an infusion. So I hope that makes sense for you um, what the difference is they're both really working in much of the same way but uh, Casimta just has a bit more of a, a higher affinity when it attaches to that cell. 
So oak rivets, the generic name is ocrelizumab and it's a six monthly infusion. So you go in for the day and have that infusion and go home and you just have that every six months. It does work on relapsing, remitting MS as well as primary progressive, but as we touched on earlier, it's actually not PBS listed for primary progressive MS. It is highly effective and it works by reducing the number of CD20 B cells that are floating around. So before you start Oprivus, they'll be doing blood tests to check your white cell count and make sure there's no conditions hiding in the, in the background of your body like hepatitis or HIV. Before you start the treatment, they'll actually do some vital signs um, and they'll continue those after you start the infusion. That's because you could have an infusion associated reaction and so they wanna check how you're going as well. They will give you some pre-medication. They'll give you a dose of steroids. Uh, you may have had these already for a relapse. The steroids are quite commonly methylprednisolone. And they'll also give you an antihistamine, which you may know as like a hay fever drug, like a Telfast, for example, or a Clarentine. And then often it could be paracetamol as well. The purpose of these pre-medications is that you are reducing the impact of the side effects. So kind of dampening down the body's response to this so it's a bit more comfortable. And there's also a titration. So even though it's a daily, like a day infusion that happens every six months, for the first infusion, they actually split it in half. So you'll have half the dose on day one. So go in, have a couple of hours of infusion, go home. And then on day 15, you come back and have another half dose. So that just gives your body a chance to acclimatise to it. After that, every six months, and just confirming you don't stay at the hospital, but it is a longer infusion, so it kind of goes for the whole day. It's a long day. Side effects. Very commonly, it could be uh, upper respiratory tract infections or flus, so being more likely to, to become sick because you're immunosuppressed. Things like sinus infection or bronchitis. And it doesn't mean you will always be sick or that if you develop a cough or a cold or a bronchitis, it doesn't mean if you become sick that you've got to rush to the hospital or that you won't be able to mount an immune um, response to these things. It just means that they might be slightly more likely to happen. Um, you'll still be able to get through these things. You might need some extra help with, from the doctor, but you will be able to, to recover from these things. And then you could be slightly more likely to have kind of viral infections or cellulitis, which is a skin infection. We touched on before the infusion associated reaction. So that can happen when the drug is going into your body or for up to 24 hours afterwards. That can include anything from itchy skin, a rash, hives, redness of the skin, you could have throat irritation, shortness of breath, swelling of the throat, um, the flushing, the feeling tired, the headache, those types of things. So if that happens whilst you're having the infusion, that's great because you're in the perfect place for that to happen. You can easily pop your hand up or call out and say, hi, I need some help, I'm not feeling well, I noticed this is something happening. And the protocol is that the infusion would be paused, they would treat that side effect and they would resume. And sometimes they'll resume at a slower rate. So they'll kind of slow down how fast the drug goes into your body and extend how long it's going into your body for. And that could minimize that as well. Because these side effects can happen up to 24 hours afterwards, it's a really good idea if you say to the team at the infusion centre, hey, um, if I go home and feel a bit funny tonight, what am I supposed to do? Who do I call? How do I manage this? There's also a, um, a potential for reduction in other white blood cell counts as well. Helpful tips. Wear comfortable clothing, sleeves that roll up. As I said, you're going to be sitting there all day, so you want to be comfy. Uh, no need to wear anything too fancy, so definitely wear comfortable clothes. And because you're gonna be there all day with not much to do other than be connected to the infusion, bring snacks. I'm sure the hospital will feed you, but what a good excuse to put a little picnic together for yourself and get some nice snacks that you enjoy eating. You might like to bring a little lap blanket, uh, bring a phone charger and take it from a nurse. An extra long phone charging cord is so helpful. You don't wanna be in the hospital with flat device or a flat phone and entertainment. So if you've got a book, a podcast, or you're downloading shows to watch offline on Netflix. Um, really good time to, to do that. And uh, some of my clients that I speak to, especially the ones with kids, are absolutely stoked because they're like, you mean I get to be alone without my children and I can watch what I want and eat what I want? So do um, use this time if you're open to, to um, really looking after yourself. You might feel a bit 
flat or fatigued for up to about a week afterwards. Everyone is different, you might feel okay, but again, just consider that for your Ocrevus week, you might feel a bit small. So again, plan your schedule around that and, and consider what you've got um, coming up and whether you wanna have some meals in the freezer or if there's people that live with you, let them know or with work, just a, a heads up to say, hey, I'm having some treatment that week or if there's big things planned, just consider that. You might like to plan for someone to drive you home as well. Again, there's no like technical reason why you can't drive home, but really good to have someone um, planned to do that just in case you don't feel great. And uh, yeah, just um, consider what you can do on that day to make it easier for yourself. And because you might feel a bit yucky about your treatment days when they roll around, especially with these infusion drugs, I always say to people, can you make it a day where something nice happens as well? Can it be the day where you always go out breakfast to your favourite place? Can it be the day where you buy yourself a new book and you're allowed to read it there? Or in your family, is it the day that everyone has pancakes for breakfast? Is there something that you can align with that day to make it a little bit less yucky? Because we can't take away the fact that you're having treatment, you have to go to hospital, but maybe we can tilt the scales back in our favour a little bit. And that gives you an opportunity to be creative and look after yourself a little bit. Cassimpta. So Cassimpta is um, offered to Moomab and it is a relapsing remitting drug. It is given monthly and it's highly effective. And it's an injection, so you give it to yourself and it's very similar to Ocrevus in the way that it works. So let's have a look at what to expect. So there's going to be pre-treatment screening and once you've started Cassimpta, they don't usually do any kind of routine tests, although they can if they want to. Doctors are allowed to, to pay extra attention, but technically there's no real um, need in terms of the advice of the manufacturer. Dosing regime is something to pay attention to. So there's actually a loading dose. So we've talked about titration, which is starting on a small dose and then slowly increasing. This is the opposite. You're starting with a higher dose to actually get that efficacy going. So you're starting with more and then reducing down to the maintenance dose. So in week zero, that's when you start, week zero you have an injection and then you have weekly injections, one and two. So three weekly injections in a row, on week three, no injection. That's when you start your monthly injections. So then you have one on week four, week eight, week 12, etc. Let's have a look at what to expect with Cassimpta. So there'll be a pre-treatment screening, some blood tests, and once you've started Cassimpta, there's no formal recommendation to have any tests done, but you really do need to pay attention with how it starts because they start with a loading dose. That's to get that efficacy up there quicker. So you'll start with a more intense regime and then it goes to a maintenance. So week zero, week one and week two, you have injections, no injection on week three, and that's when you go to the maintenance schedule of one injection every four weeks. So just confirming, you have an injection week zero, the next week on week one, the next week on week two. The next week is week three, no injection, and then you'll have week four, week eight, week 12, week 16, etc. It is stored in the fridge as well. Side effects. Very commonly, you might be slightly more likely to develop upper respiratory tract infections. You could have injection related reactions. So you could have kind of flu-like side effects after the drug goes into your body and up to 24 hours afterwards. Uh, and particularly after the first injection, we think that could happen. And less so afterwards, you might be slightly more likely to have a urinary tract infection. And you could also have injection site reactions because you're giving yourself an injection. It could be redness, pain, itching, swelling, and you might be more likely to develop kind of oral herpes as well, but um, cold sores. Cassimpta, so the helpful tips here. Well, because it's in the fridge, we want it to come up to room temperature. I said before, you're not allowed to put it in the microwave and heat these things up like leftover lasagna, but we do want to gently bring them up to room temperature. So if someone wears a bra or has boobs, you might like to pop it against your skin just to warm it up. You could put it under your arm or just sit with it in your lap, um, but don't warm it up with hot water or anything like that. It's gentle warming. Consider what time of day is best for the injection and rotate to your injection sites. And that's the same with all of these injections. You don't necessarily want to use the same place every time. By rotating 
where you give yourself the injection, that means that you're going to spread out, um, spread the love on your body, I suppose, and minimise injection site fatigue where that spot gets too bruised and um, bumped and, and, and lumpy and things like that. So you might like to keep track of where you've given yourself your injections. Because it's a monthly injection as well, we don't want you to forget. So schedule reminders in your phone, your calendar, your diary, whatever you need to do. I think there might be an app as well. So make sure that you have a way of remembering so that you don't forget because it only works if you take it. Let's have a look at our last disease modifying therapy, Lemtrida. The generic name is Alemtuzumab. It works for relapsing remitting MN, um, MS, my apologies, and it's given over tr two treatment courses one year apart. It is a highly effective drug and it kills immune cells and allows them to grow, go, um, to grow back. Let's have a look at Lemtrida. The generic name is Alemtuzumab and it's for relapsing remitting MS. It's an infusion and it's given over two treatment courses one year apart. It's highly effective and the way that it works is killing immune cells and allows them to grow back. It is so effective that there is a potential for it to cause other kind of autoimmune conditions. And so because of that, most commonly it's not used um, as a first option for people. Um, most commonly we see it used for people that have highly active um, MS. What to expect? Well, they will be giving uh, pre-medication that will be steroids, antihistamines, paracetamol, and often an anti-herpes medication as well. So the dosing is in year one, you have a daily infusion for five days in a row. Uh, most often you don't stay in the hospital, you go home at the end of each day. In year two, you have a daily infusion for three days. For the pre-treatment screening, they'll be doing blood tests and looking for some things there. And once you have the infusion, um, they'll be doing vital signs. And most importantly, there is monthly blood and urine tests for five years. So even though you're having the infusion for a couple of days here and there, you must have those monthly blood and urine tests and they're non-negotiable. There's a, a program called Blood Watch that will send you text messages if you're not having these tests and the results go to the doctor if they're outside the parameters. That's because side effects can happen at any time. So it's not just after a couple of weeks, if you feel fine, nothing's going on, you need to keep having those done. Now, why have I got an antipasto platter here? Because quite commonly you would be advised to follow a listeria aware diet, uh, which you may be familiar with as like the pregnancy diet. And that's because um, we want to minimize you coming in contact with listeria. That's the kind of deli meats and um, things like that because uh, this is an immunosuppressant and the way that it works, we don't want that to happen for you. Side effects. So infusion reactions, infections, um, thyroid disorders, rash, changes in blood pressure, heart rate, you could have some pain. Less commonly, uh, a blood clotting disorder, kidney problems, thyroid problems, and very rarely um, a white blood cell issue and also an autoimmune blood clotting issue as well. So that's why you need to keep up with those blood and urine tests because these things could happen and if they happen, you may actually not feel any symptoms of them. So that's why you've got to keep having those tests done. Helpful tips. Well, hydrate beforehand. As we've discussed, if you're having an infusion, we want it to be really easy for someone to find your vein. So make sure that you're really well hydrated and you may feel okay afterwards or may not. Everyone is different. So think about having someone to drive you home. And because you may feel a little bit yuck afterwards, have some meals prepared just in case, and you might be able to plan something nice to do. So if you do feel okay, you've got something to do, but otherwise you're well um, looked after at home. And make sure you get that schedule organized so you know when you're having your treatment and when your tests are due and get that routine going. So with these monthly blood and urine tests, so much easier if you go to the same place every time and you know that I'm making this up maybe it's the first Saturday of every month you wake up you go and get brekkie you go to that place you have that test and then you just continue on with your life so that it just becomes your automatic routine even if you're not having treatment you need to have MRI and neurologist appointments so we're going to now have a quick look at stem cell because it is a particular type of uh, therapy, autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplant is used as a disease modifying therapy in MS. Not the same as those drugs we've spoken about, but it is something that is um, rarely used. So we'll do a quick uh, run through of that. 
Now, they're big words and you might be thinking, what does that mean? So let's break it down. So we do call it AHSCT for short. Autologous means cells taken from the same person. Hemato means blood or heme. And then poetic means the making, producing, forming. Stem cell, that's the body's raw materials and transplant. You know what that means. That means we're taking something from one place and putting it to the other. So to bring that all together, AHSCT is when they take the um, blood making, producing, forming stem cells from one person and put them back into that person. So it's from your body back into your body. So in AHSCT, we're looking at stem cells and stem cells are a type of cell that can renew and repair. There are different types of stem cells and that's really important for you to know. Specifically in this instance, we're talking about those hematopoietic stem cells. That's what's used in AHSCT. These stem cells are re-infused to speed up the recovery of the immune system. This does not contribute to repairing the damaged nerves. So when we're thinking about MS, we're thinking about lesions, which has caused damage to your nerves. AHSCT is not thought to repair the damaged nerves, neither are stem cells. They're used to regenerate a new immune system that is less likely to attack the brain and spinal cord. There are other types of stem cells that may, held, um, may hold the potential to grow or repair tissue in the areas of the central nervous system, but this area is still in the early stages of basic research and is not yet used as a treatment for people with MS. So just confirming, different types of stem cells exist, different types of stem cell therapies and transplant exist. In MS, we're really specifically only looking at this AHSCT. So what happens? Well, they use chemotherapy and that is the part that is actually treating the MS. It's kind of like the chemotherapy that's used to treat blood cancers. And you may have heard of the term bone marrow transplant as well. That's where the stem cells are, in the bone marrow. Different protocols are used at different sites. What that means is that different kind of recipes um, or different ways of doing this, they alter slightly depending on what hospital is doing it. And it might change the type of chemotherapy that's used or maybe like the dose, so slight differences. And it is available in Australia now in clinical trial and also outside of trial under strict eligibility. And just to confirm again, this type of stem cell treatment is not thought to contribute to the repair of the nervous system. After it's given, there is supportive medical treatment provided because the transplant um, does have a high risk of infection and there can be risk of things like bleeding disorders due to the intense immunosuppression of it as well. So it's quite a significant treatment. This uh, image here I've taken from MS Australia's webpage. If you're interested in stem cell, do have a look at MS Australia. They have lots of information on it. So the first thing is they give you a pre-treatment to release the blood stem cells from the bone marrow into the bloodstream so that they're able to collect them. Step two is where they collect them from the, the blood stream and then they pop them in the freezer. That's step three because we don't need them just yet, but we will need them soon. Then step four, that's the chemotherapy. And that's the part that is actually treating your MS. The chemotherapy are chemicals that are killing either the immune system entirely or partially. And that is what's taking away those white blood cells that know they can go in and cause that damage. And so if they're not there, new damage can't occur. That's really, really effective. But without an immune system, you would get infections and you would die. Even sitting here now, there's dust floating around, there's germs on the end of my fingers. And without an immune system, I'm not able to fight those types of things. So we actually need to give you a new immune system that's where the stem cells come in. So they get them out of the freezer and then give them back to you. And that is what actually regrows a new healthy immune system afterwards. So the purpose of the stem cells is actually just allow you to survive the chemotherapy. Step six is very important. That's that supportive medical treatment for it could be four weeks or even longer that they need to support you afterwards because of the, the side effects. Now, I could not possibly fit all the side effects on this slide. And as I said, it does differ depending on the regime used, but it can be as follows. Someone's going to be highly susceptible to infection. As we said, because they're wiping out either their entire immune system or most of it. Previous infections can reactivate things like shingles, cold sores, herpes, and there could be other autoimmune conditions that develop like thyroid condition. 
there's side effects of the chemo itself, things like fatigue, weakness, loss of appetite, increased risk of bleeding and bruising. So I've heard of people bleeding from the bowel, for example. It can worsen your MS symptoms and it can cause um, very significant hair loss. And it also can uh, lower fertility and cause early menopause as well, specifically for women because of how strong the chemo is. Um, the chemotherapy itself can be toxic to the heart, lungs, liver or kidney, so there can be a toxicity that can occur. There's also something called engraftment syndrome as well, that's fever, skin rash um, and some issues with the lungs. It can cause cancer, that's the malignancies, and because that chemotherapy can be toxic to the testicles and ovaries, it can lead to infertility. So having this treatment may mean that you're not able to have children afterwards, and rarely, but there is a risk of death as well. So I can't stress enough that this is a very significant treatment and not to be undertaken lightly. It is not the right treatment for everyone with MS. Everybody's MS is different, and really it's more likely to be appropriate for people who have active inflammatory disease activity that is not responding to the standard disease modifying therapies that are available. Because it works better on that active inflammatory MS, it's thought to be most helpful in that relapsing remitting MS where there's relapses and active lesions um, on an MRI, it's less likely to be effective in progressive MS with no inflammatory features. So let's have a chat about side effects because all drugs have side effects and even not going on a drug there are negatives there too but when we're talking about these drugs Side effects can, can be anything. You can see the cute little pictures I've found here. It can be rash, upset tummy, could upset your gut, make you tired, make you feel sick. So you should know what am I to expect and what do I do about it? So what are the commonly reported side effects and what am I supposed to do if I experience them? Do you need to have medication on hand ready to go? So if you're starting a drug that could cause nausea, for example, do you already have a prescription for PRN, which means as needed, PRN anti-emetics, anti-nausea medication that you've already had filled from the pharmacy and it's in the cupboard. So if you start your drug and you feel crook, then you've got the medication ready to go. Um, and do you know how long they're supposed to last? So we want you to ask questions and don't be afraid to seek clarification. If you go to an MS clinic, you're likely to have access to an MS nurse, ask them. They've done this with people numerous times and are very familiar with all the tips and tricks. Ask your neurologist, your GP uh, can give you some advice, but a GP and a pharmacist are not likely to have lots of experience with these MS drugs because MS is not a common condition. It affects about one in a thousand people and then not everybody is on a medication. And as you've seen, there's about 14 available of these medications. So it's not reasonable really to expect that your GP is gonna have lots of experience with the particular drug that you're on. They absolutely can look things up and help you manage side effects potentially and same as the pharmacist but really the neuro and the MS nurse are going to be very helpful. If you see a private neurologist or you don't have access to an MS nurse you're welcome to call us and even if you have an MS nurse you can call us as well we can give you some advice and for some of these drugs there are patient support programs. They are funded by the drug company and can sometimes have people like nurses and they may have apps and little things that can help you keep track of your treatment and you can sometimes call their patient support lines for advice if you're experiencing side effects or you're not quite sure how to manage it. Maybe you're going on a holiday and want some advice of how to do those things. So don't be afraid to ask those questions. In terms of your drug, seek regular reviews. Should the side effects have subsided by now? Is there anything else I can do? And um, if the side effects are just beyond reasonable, quite often the doctor will also be saying to you, yeah, it's getting a bit ridiculous now. We might need to, to look at this. So you're not supposed to be miserably unwell on these drugs. You might not feel any different. You may feel a little bit better. Most of the time it's neutral or a little bit worse because of side effects, but People on these drugs are going to school, they're raising children, they're working, they're, they're doing all their, their normal things around this. So it shouldn't be too intrusive. But how do you pick? These quotes are just some of the things that I hear people saying all the time. They'll say, I just got diagnosed with MS, I went to the neurologist, they said they want me to start on treatment really soon, um, and they've given me two or three or four or five to pick from, and I've never even heard of these before. So they'll say, which one is the best? Like, which one works the best? 
What's the most popular? What do you find most people take? Um, which is the strongest? I want that one. Or which one has the least side effects? Or which one is the safest? Really tricky uh, when we're comparing these things. So I've listed some things to consider when you're making your decision. And by all means, you are very welcome to call and have an appointment with a nurse because that's a long conversation talking through your life, your lifestyle, your health, how you feel and putting all these things together to figure out what might be the best drug for you, which is not something we can decide for you, but we can help you understand the drugs. Things to consider, the efficacy, how well does the drug work? Are we talking about that SPF 15 sunscreen or the SPF 50? Side effects. So one drug might have more side effects, but they may not be as bad as the a drug that has least side effects. So it's not about the number of side effects. And it's also, when we're talking about side effects, is it a very manageable side effect? So is it something that if it happens, it's not a big deal, it's not that intrusive to your life, or is it something that's really common and is gonna be very intrusive to your daily life? Um, is it very rare? Is it manageable? Is it something that you could keep up with or not? So have a think about that in terms of side effects. Also the monitoring requirements. So are we talking about something that doesn't have to have any blood tests or are we talking about those monthly blood and urine tests? Treatment goals. Why are you going on this drug? What do you want for yourself? Think about your future because MS is unfortunately a progressive condition. It can get worse over time. And there are things that can happen that we don't quite have a good way of keeping up with. Changes to your neurological reserve or brain atrophy. So think about your future. Think about you as a little old person in your velvet tracksuit, um, popping around, going to bingo, playing with the grandkids if that's in your journey. What do you want for yourself? Do you want to be um, as healthy and mobile and agile as possible, have a think about where you want to be and that can help you figure out well, what's the right vehicle to get me there. Think about your values and beliefs. Um, are you someone that really values um, medical care and research and all those types of things? Are you someone that really isn't that comfortable with medication as well or a bit concerned about the side effects? So that's a good thing to bring up when you're talking to your doctor and also your lifestyle. Do you work shift work, for example? If you do, maybe a twice daily medication that has to be taken with food, is it really gonna fit well for you? Maybe you're a long haul truck driver, so something that goes in the fridge, like it's doable, but it's fussy. So think about that as well. Or even just, do you have a phobia of needles? Because there are so many drugs available, you may really wanna let the doctor know about that because I'm sure if you had to go on an injectable drug, you might be able to make it work, but it's going to be pretty yucky if you have to give yourself an injection three times a week if they really make you very, very upset and you're frightened of them. So think about that. Access to healthcare, depending on where you live as well. Um, so you might live really close to the hospital. It's not too much of a fuss or it's, you know, depending on where you're living in traffic, it could be an hour, an hour and a half to go to the hospital when you're driving. But you could be someone that lives regionally or remotely. So it could be quite a, a difficult thing to do that. And also future plans. Are you thinking, yeah, actually, we've already got this big overseas trip planned that's going to last for two years, um, or we're thinking we'd like to have a baby. So these are all things to think about and let the doctor know about when you're doing your decision making. So that's enough from me in terms of the drugs. Just want to let you know about us as an organisation. So we are here to help support you. There's lots of things that we can do to help you live well with your MS. Plus Connect is our gateway service. So when you call or you email, um, Plus Connect uh, is going to be the team that is going to support you and make referrals into like the nursing program or let you know what might benefit you. We do have lots of NDIS supports as well. Um, we have allied health and employment support programs. Peer support might be something you find really beneficial. Would you like to speak to somebody else that's been on the drug that you're going to go on, for example? So do give us a call if there's anything that we can do to support you. And on our website, we have a resource hub. That's where we keep webinars like this one, podcasts where you'll hear me talking or other people, experts. We have articles and we have a newsletter that comes out as well. So this is uh, the details for Plus Connect. So you can call on 1800 042 138 or you can email connect at msplus.org.au. I hope you found this presentation helpful. Please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Otherwise, that's it from me now. Thank you.